<clears throat> Romans chapter 9. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. So what we're going to say? Paul's going to tell the truth. He wants to, Listen, he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. We wouldn't think he was lying, but he's going to make an extraordinary statement here that, listen, this is the truth. This is my heart. My conscience also beareth me witness in the Holy Ghost. This is something that the Holy Ghost will testify in me. And we saw it in the book of Acts. That I have great heaviness and continuous sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ. Well, that's a pretty bold statement. I want to be outside of Christ. I am so burdened for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to flesh. Paul has such a love for the Jew that in the book of Acts we saw that he was warned. And yet he set his desire to go to Jerusalem to those Jews. And he didn't become a curse. But man, his ministry was shut down for a while. Though he did have a ministry. Paul loved them Jews, his people. That he disobeyed God. And it cost him dearly when it came to time. Is it wrong to have affection for people? No, Paul had it. But Paul drove it so far he sinned. No one could witness to those Jews but Paul. So I got to go down there. Peter, James, and them were doing a good job. When he arrived in Jerusalem, there were saints of Jews all around the area. And there were the enemies. Who are Israelites? To whom pertains the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises? Whose are our fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God bless forever. Amen. And we see John chapter 1, Jesus came unto his own. The very, now listen, the very purpose, the very people that Jesus Christ came were the Jewish people. Now, I made a statement today about the KKK. You cannot say you're a Christian right with God when you say you hate the Jew. Because you forgot something. Jesus Christ is a Jew. Mary, the Virgin Mary, let's give her a little title here, let's give her who she is, was also a Jewish young lady. With her roots being tied all the way back to Abraham in Luke chapter 3. God's main purpose, God's main people, are those Jews, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Paul is, I, we're God's people. I, there's a desire there. We are his. We ought to continue to be his. And yet they're not. I've been put in chains because of them. And yet I still love them. Not as though the word of God has taken none effect. For they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Uh oh. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham. Are they all children? But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Oh there's a distinction now of Abraham. <coughs> One of those great magazines. Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. I mean, Abraham, Isaac, and Ishmael, excuse me. Ishmael is not Jewish. Ishmael is not the chosen seed. You can say you're of Abraham and be of the children of Katrina, uh, Ketra. But you're not the chosen seed. 
You may claim of Abraham, but you better be of Isaac, the promise. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, Ishmael. That relationship with Hagar was nothing that had to do with God. God said, Sarah shall proceed a child, not the handmaid. That was an adulterous affair approved by two people who God had said, I, I'm walking with you. I've told you something. I'm going to give you a blessing. And okay, let's, let's, let's perform this great sin. And adultery is a great sin. And God still blessed Abraham and Sarah. But the results of Hagar is flesh. What have we been learning as we go through Ephesians, as, we, as a family, as we're reading? The flesh is at enmity with the spirit. Ishmael himself is at enmity with the world itself. And Christianity. He can't get along with anybody. These are not the children of God. Did you get that? That's why they have Allah. They have to have Allah because they don't have Jehovah. But the children of the promise are counted for the seed. There's two children. There's the children of the promise and there's children of the flesh. Those that are of the flesh are not of God. For this is the word of promise. And here it is. At this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. Genesis 18. That's what God said. He did not say Hagar. He didn't say any other woman. He said Sarah. Eve. Adam. Don't eat that one fruit. Noah. Build an ark not a fairy not a luxury liner build an ark moses build the tabernacle christian believe on the lord jesus christ when when god states one pacific that's pacific there's no room for hagar there's no room for katrina and not only this, all right, let's go one more step, all right, Abraham, Isaac. But when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, for the children being not yet born, ooh, the children not born, children not born. What did God just say? In that womb, they're children. Signed, sealed, delivered. That's what God said. Neither having done any good or evil. Well, that defeats the Jewish teaching. Well, there was it a blind man? And Peter said, Jesus is your father. So, listen, I'm going to say something because... This has happened to my wife and my wife. I'm sorry. Both have had babies who have not been born. There's no good or evil. And if they are children not yet born, guess what? They're in glory. As under the blood of Jesus Christ, I don't know. I can't tell you that. Because they never had to believe on Jesus Christ. They never had to be a Christian. And yet they are going before God. Their name will be at the, at the Lamb's Book of Life as, Hey, I didn't do good. I didn't do evil. I may be at the great white throne judgment, but I'm not worthy to be cast off into hell. So no baby in the womb does evil or does good. So when a baby comes out, it's born, 
and it is completely addicted to drugs. That's not the baby. That's what the mother did. That child comes out screaming because he knows what kind of world he's coming into. That the purpose of God, according to election, oh, there's a foul word, might stand not of works, but of him that calleth. So now we're going to have election in Rebecca's womb. There's two boys. God is going to choose one of them. And he's not going to choose the other. It is said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. Genesis 25, 23. Wait a minute. So God has ordained from the foundation of the world that uh, Jacob will be forever and Esau will die and go to hell because God elected. See? No. As is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. See, when we get to election, we're not going to get big on it. We're just gonna, you don't want to believe it? You don't believe it? God damn you. For your belief when it's wrong against the Bible. God knew, in the illustration we're right now, he knew how Esau would be and he knew how Jacob would be. He knew Jacob would be a slicer, but his heart would be right to God. He knew Esau would be lustful. And never get right with God. So on that account, even in the womb, when they've done no evil or good, God says, I'll choose Jacob. I'll refuse Esau. Foreknowing what they would do, and I'll give Esau a chance. Sell me your birthright, Esau. Well, you know, Jacob, it's very valuable to dad. It's very valuable to God. I can't do it. I'm going to honor God and my father, Abraham, I'm, uh, Isaac. I'm not going to do that birthright thing. See, Esau had a choice, and God knew that choice would come in his life. And God already knew by what Esau would do. All right, I'm going to choose Jacob. God doesn't force the boys. God does not limit the boys. He just knows. What they're going to do. God knows what I'm going to do when I have not even been faced with the consequences. And he's going to let me go through that thing knowing full well what I'm going to choose, whether good or evil, and let it play out. And he's not forcing me. He's allowing me. And if it's for evil, he's going to send many warnings. He's going to send many cares to say, that's not the way to go. This is not the thing to do. God will try all in all to go against if someone going to do evil rather than good. We're going to learn about Pharaoh. Look at all the things that God tried to get Pharaoh to do right. And yet all that, Pharaoh's in hell burning today. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he said unto Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not him that willeth, nor him that runneth, but God that showeth mercy. Well, I'm going to go out and do something for God, and by George, I'm going to do it for God, and God's going to be like, listen, is that what I want you to do? If that goes in what I have in your will in your life, I'll show you compassion and I'll show you mercy. But if you're doing it yourself, like Hagar, oh, we're going to have a baby? All right, come here, Hagar. Sarah's too old. So you got to realize God is looking at our motives. God is looking at why we're going to do what we're going to do that God already knows what we're going to do. Is it on Hagar the flesh? Or is it Sarah the promise? Will we push away the flesh and say, hey, we're going to go the way of the spirit? For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, isn't that interesting? What, what scripture? 
when Moses stepped up to the plate and said, Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Men wrote the Bible. Yeah, Moses wrote the Bible. He wrote that. Exodus 9, 16. That's written. That was written 100% by, uh, by Moses. And God inspired it. There's the inspiration of the Spirit. Working in Moses. The scripture says unto Pharaoh. Uh, Moses said it. But the scripture said it. That's, insp that's inspiration, my friend. That's God telling Moses, okay, say this, write this. By the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, there is inspiration. So someone said, well, men wrote the Bible like Moses. Yeah, 100% correct. Yep. Give me your Bible. Have them show you where the place is, where it happens. Many places. Therefore, have he mercy on whom he will have mercy and whom he will harden. Pharaoh wasn't going to get no mercy. Maybe in the beginning for a while there. But each and every time, didn't he get mercy? Oh, you, you grind this away? Okay, we'll get rid of it. And then they go out, get rid of it, and then he hardened his heart again. With all the war, I think there's ten, nine or ten plagues against, against Egypt. Each one of those plagues, Pharaoh could have said, that's it, I'm done, I'm getting right. You guys go out in the wilderness to serve your God, and guess what? I'm going to trail behind you, not as your enemy, but just as a humble servant of your God, Jehovah. I'm going to bring some sacrifices, if I may, also. No, he followed Israel. He followed them to the promised land to his death in the Red Sea. God said, of all the people in Egypt, that man, I know he's of Satan. I know he won't do right. I need somebody who's going to persecute those Jews and drive them out of the land. That's the perfect man. Now he can get right. Each one of those plagues, he could have truly repented and got right, and he did it, and God knew that. Are you telling me one of those times, frogs, uh, the blackness, or whatever? Are you trying to tell me that Pharaoh would step up Moses and Aaron on his knees saying, I'm sorry, God. Are you trying to tell me God would, re would have rejected him? Absolutely not. We got to realize when we see people, God already sees people in the future. He has seen me. God knows when I'm going to die. Whether it be rapture or death. If I die before the rapture, God knows who's going to be at my funeral. God knows how I'm going to die. God knows, if, if Lord willing, how much of an attitude I'm going to have to get up in the morning. Tomorrow. He sees all of it. He sees me walking down the street and someone coming up and saying, give him a gospel track. He sees, okay, let's see what he's going to do. Is he going to give that gospel track or is he not? Listen, God ain't going to come down with a 10, 10 uh, pound Paul being here. Give him a gospel track. Just want to see. I know if he's going to do it or I know he's not going to do it. But I sent that guy his way. Imagine me giving an account for God has sent somebody in my path and whether I reject it or not. Moses and Aaron were set in Pharaoh's track and Pharaoh rejected. Thank God Moses and Aaron did right. Pharaoh cannot stand the great white throne judge and say, I never knew. God doesn't even have to call Moses up. Moses, can we have Moses' rod, please, and Aaron's rod? Oh, no, keep that thing away. <laughs> A walking stick would condemn Pharaoh. Nay, but, O oh man, who art thou that repliest against God? I looked that word up. Reply. I didn't realize it was reply. Reply against God. Shall the thing forms say to him that form? Why hast thou made me thus? Imagine you're on a potter's wheel and God has made you a vase. 
God, why didn't you make me find China where I could sit in that cabinet and everybody could see my beauty? I'd be worth something. God, why'd you make me a spittoon? Of all the things, you have to make me a spit a, a, a chamber pot? God, come on. Really? That's the best you can do for me? Then you better be the best chamber pot you can be for God. We got to stop making ourselves finer china than what we are. We got to realize clay comes from the earth. Earth is dirt. Earth is dead. We come from dirt. And God can do whatever he wants and make whatever he wants with us. And realize in a full Christian life, I mean, if you love the Lord, you're doing right. You realize how many times God's got to take that clay and smush it back up? Well, can't do that with him. He messed that up. <clears throat> got to start over again. There's sometimes I, I, I assume that that potter's got to take that clay and just put it right back in the mound again. It wouldn't work. Got too dry, got too wet, too much of junk in it. Didn't spin it quick enough. Didn't work it hard enough. It wouldn't yield. Has not the powder, God, power over the clay? Me? He's the potter, I'm the clay. Of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. We all come from the dirt. We're all going back to the dirt. We are all vessels to God. We can be clean vessels. We can be filthy vessels. We can be uh, fully functional vessels. We can be vessels that are complete, finished. We could be vessels that God brings out on the special occasions. We could be vessels that God uses daily. But we have no right to tell that tell that potter, hey, this is not what I want to be. You need to realize, look at our life as vessels. Whatever God has made, we could be to honor and to dishonor. There's no middle road there. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long-suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he has afore prepared unto his glory. Now that's hard. That's a hard thing, those two verses. You got somebody that's not saved, won't do right. And you may know who they are. And God, through their choice, through their free will, may bring them to destruction that you may see who you really are and benefit from what really God has blessed you with. Realize the greatest blessing we're going to, we're going to get will come after the judgment seat of Christ, will come after you know, the great tribulation and all that. It's when we realize how few we were to all those that go into hell at the great white throne judgment. <clears throat> you realize the multitudes and multitudes and multitudes of people who are going to burn in the lake of fire. Whereas we're going to watch all these people and realize we're on the safe side. We're on the winning side and there's not going to be many of us. We don't know what the population of Noah's time is, but only eight? Don't you think when they, when those eight got out of that boat, man, they were truly thankful when they saw the whole world wiped out? Lot gets out of Sodom. Three people. Out of the entire city, I think there's five cities. Don't you think when Lot got out of that cave one morning, he looked at that area and saw five cities destroyed. Don't you think he thanked God for his mercy and grace? You know all those people that died during the flood? You know all those people that died in Sodom and Gomorrah in the neighboring city? You know what did it show? You were spared. That's God's wrath. 
You are on God's mercy and grace. Hit the neck on your knees and thank God. You're not where they are. You know why I preach on the street? The way that I believe that God's given me to preach. Because those people are going to face judgment one day. They are going to die. I don't want them to go to hell because I've had a taste of heaven. I've got the righteousness of God and I want them to know about it too. Because I stood in their place one day when somebody witnessed to me and told me with an open Bible. And I pray they would be like me, listen, oh wow, following along with the word. Listen to what the, the gentleman was telling me. And it hearing, I pray for that. And I've sat with people, I've opened the word of God and they just don't listen. And I sat there when I was witnessing the people that would not listen. And I sat there and I'm like, thank God I didn't do this, Lord. I'm witnessing it. Thank God, Lord, I wasn't like this guy here. But Lord, I pray for his soul, but thank you, Lord. I received the word. That guy there who's going to reject Christ is for me to say, thank you, God, that I did receive. Sometimes the wrath of God is to bring those that are not under the wrath into fulfillment and joy of what God has done for us. Even us, whom he have called not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles, thank God. Hosea 1.10. I'm part of it. I am of it. I can walk up to a Jew at a synagogue in Daytona Beach and say, listen, we're brothers through Abraham. And be truth and be honest and be serious. And yet, you are after... The fleshly part of Abraham. You're not of the spiritual part. I will go to be with Abraham in glory. And you'll go off into, into the devil's lake of fire. Which burns forever. You need to get saved. As he says in Hosea. That's Hosea. If we call them my people. Which were not my people. Gentiles. And her beloved, which was not my beloved, Gentile. So the Bible in the Old Testament, guess what? Spoke of us being saved. Peter missed that. There are places in Hosea, Isaiah, Joel, about us. Did you know your prophecy? After the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ fulfilled all 100% prophecies of his first coming, death, burial, and resurrection. And yet there's still prophecy going on right now. What's that? Gentiles are getting saved. Amen. We are a prophecy. And you know how that's going to anger the Jew at the great white throne judge and say, Hey, listen, Hosea, you want to tell them what you said in chapter 1, verse 10? What's chapter 1? All right, this, they added chapter markers. Oh, okay. And he's going to read before his nation of Jews saying, listen, there are people that we don't love. There are people we don't care about. And yet they care about our Savior, our Messiah, Jesus Christ. So they're going to condone you to death because they believe the scriptures more than you did. The very fact is that there are Christian churches around the synagogue. Hosea said it would happen. Bible's got to be correct. Amen. I fulfilled scripture. How? By being saved as a Gentile. Isaiah is also crying, or cries, concerning Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a raiment shall be saved. That's a, all the sand in the sea and only a raiment? And shall come to pass that in the place where it is said, Unto them, ye are not my people. They shall be called the children of the living God. All right, that's an important verse I shouldn't miss. You know that verse that says, me as a Gentile who's believed on Jesus Christ? I am a son of God. There's another place that says, I am a child of the living God. Paul made sure he knew what the Jews were reading. 
Isaiah is also crying, saying, Though the number of the children of Israel be as... Now we're going to Israel. A raiment shall be said. All you Jews, and you're all Jews, under Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But you know what? Very few of you are going to come out. Just like Noah. Just like Lot. You know, really, in, in Abr Abram, when he was called out of Calvary, it was only supposed to be Abram and Sarai. That was it. No lot. The Bible works in minimal numbers. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. Hmm. I guess God wanted all Israel saved, didn't he? But they wouldn't adhere to what God told them. God did not want us in pain and suffering today, but Adam and Eve did not obey. And as Isaiah says before, except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we had been as Sodom uh, and made like unto Gomorrah. And how many people came out of those two cities? None. There's no people there now today. They're dead. They're gone. Lot was carried out by the angels. 100% pro uh, population loss. And it wasn't for the mercy of God, Israel would have been like that. That explains why Israel, who they are today, they are God's people. Paul is telling us, listen, the Gentiles are believing. Come on, guys, will you get right? My heart is breaking for you. My jury of my people are going to go to hell. Will you believe? Pharaoh stood against you guys, and God got rid of him. Paul is pointing to the Jews in this chapter. Get right. You are of God's, but you want the flesh. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which follow not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. Well, look at that. The Gentiles did not get their righteousness. They got their righteousness because of faith. So it came by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. My salvation is not of myself. It's of what Jesus Christ had done for me. But Israel, which follow after the law of righteousness, have not attained to the law of righteousness. They killed the Messiah. Uh, thou shalt not kill. That's a big boo-boo. We're law-abiding citizens. You killed. Barabbas was supposed to be, have been killed, but you let him go. That's a violation of Scripture. Wherefore, because they saw it not by faith. Oh, so you got to have faith. But as it were by the works of the law, they wanted to do it their own way. That's not God approved. I'm going to get saved by what I... No, that's it. That verse says, because they saw it not by faith, but, but as were the works of the law. Faith versus works. Faith is what God wants. He doesn't want works. The works were done by Jesus Christ. For they stumble at the stumbling stone. That was spoken of Jesus Christ. They tripped over him. As it is written, behold, I lay in Zion. The mountain of the Lord. A stumbling stone. And rock of offense. They did not like that rock, did they? And watch this. <coughs> Whosoever believeth on him, the rock, the stumbling stone, shall not be ashamed. And wait till we see about that ashamed in the next chapter. 
about Jews and Gentiles not being ashamed by believing in the Lord Jesus Jesus Christ. Ooh, this, this picks up good in the next chapter. And we're going to get in the next chapter how to be saved. He's been talking about addressing the Jews. He wants them saved. 